100% fake free. This is the Robbie Crew Show, and we're live from my garage. And famous people are gonna sit right there. Nice. 90% of all single use plastic goes to landfill or ends up in our oceans. Unsmother nature, let it breathe. Episode 10 of the Robbie Crew Show. We've made it this far with your help as well. If you haven't subscribed yet to the channel, please do so. There's a subscribe button just down the bottom. Also hit the uh, notification button so that you know that when we are launching a new video or we've got some new content. We've got a returning guest on the show today. Uh, if you haven't yet, during the week we've posted a bunch of the stuff that he's done. But Peter Fenter, incredible to have you back. Thanks for being here again. I'm going to fall straight into it. Uh, we're going to be talking bikinis today, bikinis and fitness indeed. First of all, before we get to the nice part, fitness. This is a game, being a deep diver, that you really got to be on your game. You got to be fit to do this. Yes, yes. Uh, I think in the, the previous um, episode, we chatted about the technical side of it and the physiological issues that, that you know, that can go wrong with you. And the different gases <coughs> that you're taking yes. into your body, yeah. And one of them is, for example, carbon dioxide build up in your body. And if you're not fit, if your lungs don't work well, um, you will lose presence of mind and things can definitely go wrong. Um, and also, you have to be fit. And during the dive, everything is relaxed, chilled. But when things go wrong, that's when you need to be absolutely fit. And also, you know, three hours decompression, um, you know, it takes a lot out of you. Yeah. You don't really realize it, but, um, and, and from my friend, you know, Gomez, you know, who's the world record holder, he's extremely fit, you know. Um, I'm just, I was, I'm average fit, but he's next he's level. very fit. Yes, yeah. yes. So. Nuno Gomez, <coughs> just to put it in perspective for somebody that's watching now, is a deep sea diver, well, he goes for, he's the rec world record holder. In yes. fact, about 318 or 320 meters deep that the man went. Correct, yes. What was the decision <coughs> on going to, but first, let's, before we get to that, who is Nuno Gomez? Nuno Gomez uh, was born in, in Portugal and they moved here um, when he was 14 years old. Um, he grew up at the ocean in Portugal, spearfished, and he also was landlocked in Johannesburg in Pretoria. That didn't stop him, you know, um, he progressed to uh, a trimix deep dive instructor, deep cave dive instructor, and holds the, the deepest cave dive record in the world in Busmanschat, in Kuruman in South Africa, 282 meters. And then he went to the Red Sea to also claim the deepest sea or open water record. And that's how, um, you know, he did his research and he found that the Red Sea, because the, the deep water is so close to the shore and because it's a smallish ocean, um, there are no currents, However, the wind can cause problems, which, which it did. But um, you know, that seemed to be the most suitable uh, place to try and attempt something crazy like that. <laughs> you did attempt something crazy like that. How is it, how big a team do you need to do this? I mean, you mentioned in the last program as well that you need, like, <coughs> if you're going down, you need four other people on four different spots and this and that. It's the decompression, it's going back up. There's a lot of work that goes into something like that. Yes, yes. So, <coughs> you know, we'll do it. Solo dive to 300 meters plus. Um, however, it takes a team of about 18 people to make that happen for him. Um, he on that on those dives, he used about 40. He used about 48 scuba cylinders mm -hmm. for him personally. We, the support divers, also used yeah. about that much. It's a you know it's a 12 and a half hour dive. Um, when I was his deep support diver. I had my own su deep support team. So you went deeper than certain people who were looking after you as well. Right? Yes, yes. So I had people looking after me, but the whole team looked after, mm -hmm. after Nuno. Um, anyway, he did, you know, he did his research and found that you know, the Red Sea would be um, the most suitable place to go. But, and, and it is a, certainly a team effort. We had people from Poland, Russia, South Africa, of course, um, Egypt, um, so it was a multinational or international team. 
Also, cool being part of a world world record. Oh, of course, fun. yes, yes, yes. And uh, I mean, it, it was spotted a, a seal again to now world record. Yeah, it was. It, 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 it was an honor to be asked by Nuno to be his deep support. Um, it was that's the first time someone makes contact with him on his way up, and um, and on the first attempt in two thousand um, and and four. Um, something did go wrong on the first attempt and I was the first person there to see that, you know, things are not going right. Swapped cylinders, helped him, you know, because by that time he was chasing, almost holding his breath to each next decompression stage. And, um, but anyway, we sorted out the problem. It was tough, but, um, yeah, and the year after that he was back and he then broke the, the world record. And there were many attempts, this was in 2005, many attempts after that to break the record. Some of them ended in fatalities, others were, you know, severe decompression sickness, others basically faked the dive evidence or did not have any evidence but made the claims. But anyway, it, the, the position is still, you know, um, that he holds the current record at the moment. Um, there have been a couple of attempts and claims, but it was not proven, you know, so, yeah. Look, one of, one of the coolest stories I've read of you is uh, Bikini Atoll is a place where you've <coughs> been diving, which I think is an incredible place to go for anybody that is a diving fanatic. But yeah. how does it work? Tell me more about Bikini Atoll. It's not just a bunch of people running around in bikinis. It's actually where they blew stuff up. They blew a lot of shit up there. Yes, yes. So. Uh, Bikini Atoll is part of the, the Marshall Islands, and if you look at the Pacific Ocean, if you try and find the most remote spot in the Pacific Ocean, that is where it is. And if you Google Earth it and you fly into it, you know, it's just in the middle of absolutely nowhere. Um, and <clears throat> I was lucky enough to be asked to, to join and be a cameraman and, you know, part of the, the expedition. And the idea was to go and dive on the shipwrecks that you can see on that iconic nuclear explosions that happened there and um, to go and see what, what it looks like now and also to go and dive on the shipwrecks. To have a look at what, you know, nature, the coral reefs, because it's a pristine, or it used to be a pristine coral atoll and um, in the middle of the ocean. And untouched. 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 And uh, there were small populations staying on an island close by and on Bikini Island itself. Uh, however, after one of the nuclear tests, which was a complete environmental disaster, there was nuclear fallout on a lot of the islands in the chain and everybody was evacuated. They replaced <coughs> meters and meters of topsoil, replanted palm trees, um, the ocean was toxic, um, it was just a complete disaster. And uh, after that they stopped the, the tests as well because it was just too toxic to, to what get was there. What was that? What was the decision to go, well, we're not going to do this here anymore, it's obviously affecting our, our nature, well, nature, mother nature too much. Yes, so obviously there was an environmental impact, but I think the social impact, because the few inhabitants of that area all had to be moved to, to the Marshall Islands. And, um, and it was just not safe for the, the US Navy at that stage to carry on conducting these tests because everything was radioactive. And, um, and strangely enough, the ocean recovered in what is it, the 50s, in the, next, you know, the last 50, 60 years, completely recovered. It's beautiful, although there are craters which are about two kilometers wide. But you've been in those craters. You yes. physically went and dove yeah. in there. How, and, how does it look? And how it's, amazing it's it is. covered in soft coral. The fish life is abundant. Um, it looks beautiful. And, um, and in my opinion, it is because it was untouched by humans the last 60 years. And the ocean certainly has the capacity to, you know, to rejuvenate and recover. That's crazy. I mean, but being in, in like diving there and, and you've, you've seen plastic. I mean, you've seen plastic yes, drifting on the around islands. in places where we've, we just mentioned now it's been untouched mm. by humans. 
untouched by humans, but it's not untouched. It, we've, um, maced, we've done our best. We have yes. maced that up as well. Lots of fishing nets, um, plastic bottles, uh, these containers, anything um, that washes up, especially on the, the trade wind side. Um, and, you know, you would think you won't see anything, but you do. You know, um, yeah. And also, I mean, you say when you go down there, to explain to somebody that is a diver, how amazing is Bikini Atoll? Yes, so it, it's, a, it's an atoll, so it's surrounded by islands and a few inlets into the, into the, the, the lagoon. And the lagoon is it's fairly large. Um, the bottom is about 55 meters deep. And in the lagoon lies all those wrecks, and there are some famous wrecks um, that we went diving on. The one is the uh, it's an aircraft carrier, the USS Saratoga. And when she was sunk, she was fully fueled, fully armed with live bombs, torpedoes, um, full of airplanes, um, P-51 dive bombers and um, fighter planes. Um, so it was a fully functional aircraft carrier and they wanted to test what the effect of the blast would be. Other famous shipwrecks that we dived on was the, the Nagata and it was a famous Japanese battleship. Also World War II. <coughs> also used in the World War II. And the Nagata was a, a war prize to the US and they decided to just blow it up. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Thank you so much, through <laughs> that. Yeah. <laughs> blow it up. But yeah. they battled to, to sink her because um, she was a tough, tough ship. Um, a three-layered hull and she lies upside down. And uh, yeah, we, we had a, I had a bit of a scare in one of the dives in, in there because um, the Nagata lies upside down like a tortoise shell and you have to go down underneath and then go up into to get into the ship. Yeah, the hole basically, yes. Yeah. Yes, and it's uh, so, and obviously it's dark, it's, you know, it silts up quickly and uh, because it's a Japanese ship, the, you know, the doorways are quite narrow and with a video camera two cylinders you know it becomes quite a bit of a an issue to swim through eh? and uh, anyway and on one of the dives we just took a little shortcut through you know through the ship and i was behind with the camera filming nuna and the, the other diver the um the leader and as i was catching up I realized suddenly they were completely gone. And we were then past the, the line, uh, the guideline, and anyway, I decided, you know, what am I gonna do now? Um, if I try and swim back, I will get lost and die. You know, if I swim away from this spot, if they do come back, they won't find me. So what I did was I just switched the lights of my camera off and waited there for eight minutes for Nuna and the other guy to come back. Did they and eventually come back? They'd, thank God they did. Oh, God. <laughs> anyway, I'm the not built for these movies, <laughs> Peter. I'm really not. Jeez, yeah. Yeah, no, just the darkest dark yeah. you can imagine. Anyway, I switched the lights off so that I can see their lights when they return. And um, thank God they did. Anyway, um, and then we went out. But it was uh, one of the scary moments. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, just, it's not a joke to dive or to, to wreck dive if anything goes wrong. Sure, no, no, once again, I've seen too many movies. But so how beautiful, would you compare that to dives that you've done? How beautiful is it there? You know, um, I, I would say it's one of the best dive areas I've been to. You know, um, it takes six hours, uh, six flights and 24 hours sailing to get there. And that's why it's so remote. It, it is possible to go and dive there now. They do have charters that can take you. Um, it's certainly worthwhile to go. It's fantastic. Um, so, and it's pristine, you know. They, they are islands which are just completely surrounded with sharks, and sharks normally show a healthy ecosystem. And um, no, it, it's just fantastic. I have to say the Red Sea, where we had the world record dives, also absolutely fantastic you know and it's weird that it's up there as well like it's very salty eh? in the red sea um, it, uh, yeah you're thinking of the dead oh, sea dead i think sea. yes but 
certainly because it's a smallish um, uh, part of the ocean, it, the salt quality is a little bit, uh, or concentration is a little bit higher for sure. Talk to me about Namibia. I mean, just off the coast of Africa, right here in the <coughs> south tip of Africa, we've yes. got some. I mean, we've got some beautiful dives. Yes, yes. Uh, the, there are two dive sites in Namibia where we dive. There are quite a few, but the two main ones we uh, we went to. The one is Lake Ochukotu. Um, it's a sinkhole, and its maximum depth is about 80 meters or so. So it's not that crazy deep. Um, the visibility is not that good, but why it's so famous, when the South African army in, invaded um, Namibia in World War I, they chased the, the German army up north and they dumped the um, ammunition, cannons, everything in Lake Ochukota so that the South African army cannot capture it. And all of those things are still in the lake and well preserved. It's beautiful to go and dive and watch this. Some of it has been taken out and it's in the, the museum in Shumet. Um, so you can see the pristine recovered one and also underwater. And then the other dive site, which was quite nice, um, is like Gunas. It's much larger, it's about 80 meters by 50 meters. It's also a massive sinkhole, and that goes down to about 140, 150 meters, and it's got quite a lot of caves going in to the sides. Um, it's a mission to dive there because you have to abseil up and down, which it's about a 30, 40 meter drop to, sure. to the water. So um, it's a, again, it's like an expedition style um, to go and dive there. You know, it's a team effort. Yeah. Yeah. Did you see yourself when you were studying that you were going to be doing all of this? No, that you no. Be, that you were going to be diving, <coughs> that you were going to be discovering dinosaur fish? Like. No, no, not at all. No, it's just, just I think it all started with the, the coelacanth. Mm -hmm. You know, I love exploring. Mm -hmm. um, so whenever I dive, I keep my eyes open. You know, there's all, always something around the corner. Um, it's true. So what's, what's next for you? What, what, do you? what do you still want to do? Are there any spots in the world that you almost haven't dived or still want to go and see? You know, there was an um, a expedition that I tried to, to organize, but then my children got born because this would have been quite a difficult thing. Um, the location's called Lake Kashiba in, in Zambia, close to the Copper Belt, I think, uh, um, Andola, or, yes. And um, what it is, it's also a sinkhole. It's about 180 meters by 70 meters. And the caves that go on in the side has never been explored. But the reason what, why it was interesting for me was um, there's a legend that there were two tribes fighting. And um, the, uh, the, the, the leader of one of the, the tribes got killed. And they, the whole tribe decided to commit suicide by jumping, tying themselves together and jumping into, the, into that lake. And it would have taken, you know, and in those lakes, um, the, you know, the bones would have been preserved because of the low oxygen levels. So it would have been possible to go and possibly film whether this legend it is true happened, or not. Yeah. You know? So that was a bee in my bonnet and we got close to, to doing it, but it, it might still happen. We'll, we'll see. You know. Tell me about, except for the coelacanth, I mean, which was, you thought you were goofed or knocked in the beginning, like yes. for the first time. What else have you seen in these depths that have really just like... You know, the, the, the strange, uh, in, in Lake uh, Guinness, I was on a dive on my own, and I was swimming into a cave, and it, so it's not like you would think a cave would be uh, a narrow tunnel. It was a, a wide, flat tunnel. So, and the, the bottom of the, the tunnel looked like, you know, a dried up uh, a lake, you know, that uh, um, Like a lake mud. bed, yes. yes. Yeah, 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 with and, those cracks. And yes. the top as well. So clearly it was this lake bed that got split up. And I was swimming in this and I saw a, uh, in, in my lights, I saw a little bone 
which is about five millimeters thick and about 30, meters, uh, 30 centimeters long. And um, obviously it must have been from some flying creature, you know, because it's so thin and fragile. But it was fused in the rocks, I, I couldn't pick it up. Um, but anyway, I continued swimming. And when I got close to the edge of the, the tunnel, uh, the deeper end, um, that part drops off into the abyss to 140 meters or whatever. Oh, I got it. And That's deep. I just saw this massive bone lying there. And when I picked it up, it was solid rock. And um, it just so happened that, um, well, I took it out and we took it to Witts um, University and they determined it was the femur of an extinct rhino, the species which was extinct for this is like years ago. millions Jeez. of years ago. And anything between 3 and 13 million years old. And anyway, um, we shipped that fossil back to, to the Namibian authorities, the um, Namibian Heritage Council who got, got into trouble. I was about to say, because it's not yours, yeah. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> yeah, we, I was oblivious and I almost got into trouble for that, but shipped it back and um, so it, it, the issue was resolved. But it just shows to, uh, shows to show that, um, you know, this, when it's uncharted territory, anything is out there. And I'm, I'm sure if you investigate further or survey further, there will be plenty of other fossils around there. And, and some others that I've seen is fused into the rock. And I, obviously I was hoping to find the skull of whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and the rhino horn and yes. everything <laughs> like proper. That would have been cool. <laughs> would have been awesome. But uh, uh, it, it might still be there. You know, you don't know. It might have fallen off that edge. Um, then that would be very difficult uh, to find. That's going to be a deep possible. dive. Yes. Yeah. And your kids, have they, uh, you mentioned earlier, are they, are they following in your footsteps? Are they doing what dad they, does? Are they they both did the open water one courses and we've gone in a couple of dives. But I, I'm, I'm, you know, the, the, those dives are very risky, the deep dives. So, you know, I've, I've cooled down a bit. Um, so, but, you know, I dive with the boys and my wife also dives and... Yeah, the boys need a dad, you know, you can't yes. go, can't no, go no. 300 meters <laughs> deep anymore because... No, 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 it's just, yeah, it's, you know, at, at some stage you have to say, okay, you know... Um, That's enough. The risks are yeah. not worth it. Yeah. But also, it, it does it, it or <coughs> not do you see it in your kids, but obviously there's, there, if there's no future, I mean, if we don't have, if we don't look after our planet, if we don't look after our oceans, if we don't look after what we're doing, I mean, the next thing we're going to be visiting aren't Bikini Islands, it's going to be... You know, plastic islands that yes. are going to be floating yeah. by. So floating plastic exactly. islands. Oh, yeah. Are the kids these days falling into that category of saving the planet? You know, I, I think they are far more aware mm -hmm. of environmental and social issues than we were when we grew up, you know. Um, and we weren't. I mean, I'm not yeah. going to lie to you, but we, plastic yeah. straws are plastic straws. Yeah, we didn't do we think care, you know. Um, certainly they are far more aware of this, um, you know, recycling. Um, they are doing their bit, you know, they love nature. They're out as much as they can, so yes, you know, they certainly, they are. They're doing their yeah, thing. They love the diving as well, so yes. Yeah. And you, where are you staying now, down in, down, down the coast? In, well, in, in Stalamos. Oh, it's close enough to the coast. Yes, yeah, no, yeah, remember when yeah. I drive an hour from Yarm in Joburg, that sucks. Like, <laughs> you drive and you're on Strand and you're yes, somewhere yeah, there. So yeah, yeah. Spend a lot of time in the ocean, spend a lot of time at the sea? I do. Uh, I started surfing again and... Oh, nice. um, but I picked up a small little issue, so um, it's on the back foot now. But um, both my boys bodyboard, they take it seriously, um, they ride their mountain bikes, so uh, yeah. Peter, thank you very much for joining us again on the Robbie Crew Show. It's great to see that you're not plastic as well, and that you're carrying our name. Good to be back. Down on the coast. <laughs> okay. With your future yeah. endeavors, all the best. We look forward to uh, following that and all the rest. Do you post some of your stuff? Can we see some of your videos and so on? You know, I've been planning to start a YouTube channel because I have so much video material with me and I'm not doing anything with it. Um, hopefully we'll show a bit of it on your show. Definitely. definitely. Um, but I am planning to post some of it, you know. Yes. Man that took a photo of a dinosaur fish, the one and only Peter Fenter. Thank you very much for being on the show. Really appreciate it. Awesome. And, uh, Thanks. To yeah. deeper dives. <laughs> well, not anymore, but yeah, you get it. You get it. Cool, that's the
the end of episode 10. Thanks for watching. Go subscribe. I'm Peter Fente and I'm still not plastic. Hi, I'm Justin from Ichthys Aquaponics and I'm not plastic. I'm not plastic segment for this week is uh, a very interesting guy and you're definitely going to learn something today if you haven't yet. It's something that we were interested in a while ago. But uh, Ictus, Ictus Aquaponics. I hope I got it right. Justin. You know what, Robbie? Well done. <laughs> Thank That's, you. Sir. I've heard every name yeah. on the planet. He, so he arrived here. Yeah. <laughs> he arrived here and he said that uh, it's like ichthyology or what? Ichthyology. Ichthyology. And yeah. I was like, oh, explain it to a radio DJ that doesn't know much. What so, do you guys do? So basically, we're an aquaponics business. Um, we'll get into what aquaponics is. But basically, the heart of what we do is to change the future of farming mm. or to future proof mm. farming. And aquaponics itself, what exactly is that? I know it's got to do with fishes, water, and growing stuff. And that cycle yeah. is very good for it. Good for the Yeah, yeah, kind of. So, so aquaponics actually mm. joins two farming methods. It takes aquaculture, so that's the aqua part of aquaponics, and hydroponics, that's the ponics part of aquaponics. Now, aquaculture, farming of fish. Fastest growing industry in the world. Uh, we are farming more fish today than we're catching in the season. Oh, so, fish farming in its own right is one methodology that's part of aquaponics and obviously hydroponics which is the growing of plants in a soilless media using nutrient rich water, so Ridiculous. feeding those plants. Mm -hmm. Now the beauty of why would these two things go hand in hand, I mean what's fish got to do with plants, nothing, but they solve problems for each other, they mimic nature. So the fish, when they eat, they excrete, they, they produce a lot of nutrient which is actually a problem in fish farming. What do you oh, do so with that, that waste? Go? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. often that waste is dumped, environmentally dumped or, mm -hmm. you know, you use lots of water. Now we take that fish waste and we feed it to the plants. Mm -hmm. The plants extract all the nutrition from that mm -hmm. and what goes back to our fish is clean water. So, so it's 100% it's it's yeah. recycled. So mm -hmm. we don't waste water, we use 100% uh, of all the water is recycled. Now, and all that goes to the plant material as well and then comes back and it's correct. just a, that so, so get in your head, farming yeah. fish using 95% less water than traditional farming. Like, Jeez. That's, and I mean irrigation, it's like a drought. It's, this, yeah. it's that. It's when we don't have water that we can use. That's the thing. Yeah. I mean, we'll be in water deficit in the yeah. next five years. So what are we doing yeah. about it? And yeah. so aquaponics, when I found out about it, I just thought this is yeah. This is magical. I mean, I love fishing. So that was my hook. <laughs> yeah, that's that like, was yeah. My hook, I, yeah. I was about to say, like, where did, where did this whole thing, because I mean, you, you've been going for quite a while. You've been going yeah. for about seven years yeah. now. This is, yeah. again, not something that's happened overnight. I'm an incredible businessman. But where did that whole love for it come from? You decide, I'm, I'm going to do this. So I've always been passionate about farming, mm -hmm. um, especially conservation agriculture. Mm -hmm. And uh, when my son was born, we were looking to move out of Parkhurst into somewhere with a bit more space and a garden. And a friend told me, hey, come check out this yeah. house uh, for sale. It's on a plot in Midrand. And I'm like, a plot? Yeah. I'm not so <laughs> yeah. sure about this. I went through and on the, the, the plot, yeah. he had an aquaponics farm. And he was one of the first guys to, to do it in the country. To get into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah correct. And when I saw it, I said to the wife yeah. who buying this place, I'm yeah. sorry. Like, I fell in love with it. Oh, wow. And so from there I taught myself, I, I went on different courses, and I became obsessed. Mm. Um, but at that time I was also working uh, for the banks. So it wasn't your, it wasn't your full time thing? Not, your... not when I started. Is it at the moment now? Is no, it, it has is been. It so for how many are you guys growing? What are you guys busy with now? So, uh, so basically over the last, like you say, seven mm. years we've developed the business and it's, it's shifted and it's evolved. Um, but at the end of the day we've got multiple assets of it. So what we realized was when I started there was nowhere to go learn. Mm. There was no one doing it. There was no educational aspect. So we started the academy and the academy was really to take what we had learned from our own farming and then be able to help farmers not make those same mistakes. So you're educating people to actually know how to do aquaponics, yeah, how to get this whole and, and having been one of the first mm. farmers really in the world mm. to do it commercially we realized a lot of the issues along the way that was stopping the progress. And the stumbling blocks, yeah. Yeah, yeah correct. Okay, yeah. So, so we started the academy, which is based off all of our learnings um, from our farming, you know, over the years. Um, we've, you know, set up um, a, a process that I like to call an end-to-end -end for clients. Mm -hmm. So we help you from day one, 
What is aquaponics? How does it work? We help you with designing the right system for the right area. We help with the construction of it. Um, and then we support you. And that's where my heart is, to support the farmer because farming's hard. Mm. It's hardcore. Yeah, it's a, it's a constant you know? thing. I mean, it's an everyday thing. It's an everyday yeah, thing. Yeah, you know? It's like yeah, yeah. people are so used to this, a business, you know, a digital business, and I do this, and I just make money, and I can do it from my bed. Farming's not that. And when yeah. things go wrong, you need support to mm -hmm. be able to overcome it. So Why are your fish not producing? Why is this yeah, not happening? Why no, is that exactly. not happening? So you guys can come and set up a proper whole growing system at a house, at a you know supermarket, wherever it might be, or at a mm -hmm. building. You guys do that whole thing from, from beginning to end. Yeah, 100%. Oh, you know, wow. we, we're setting up systems in all over, actually, mm -hmm. in Guinea, Mauritius, Zimbabwe, Botswana, South Africa. Um, but it's just exciting to see this industry grow. Amazing, it um, really is. It really, really is. And, and like I said, it's, for me, it's the future of farming. It's natural, it's organic. So Justin, on what scale, I mean, you speak about this replacing traditional farming, on what scale can you do this and what would you grow? Like what things are you able to grow? So, look, great question. Mm -hmm. I mean, in terms of scale, you can have something, you know, here on your, on your doorstep if you want. Mm -hmm. um, all so growing just to, for my own house, just yeah, for that? Yeah. yeah, I mean, we put systems in shops that the plants That's were cool. literally still growing in, that wow. customers bought living product from. Um, all the way up to mm. full-scale hectare size systems um, but yeah. it completely depends on obviously the market mm. and the region and and various mm. factors but like you mentioned the crop that you grow has to be a high value crop mm. so typically what we're growing is things like tomatoes cucumbers herbs lettuce your greens so yeah your greens yeah. Um, you know as a staple mm. spring onions chives uh, which is your common consumables mm your fresh you know your fresh yes, yes, yes. but the beauty is we're located and you can do it anywhere so you, you you can literally build it on a concrete slab if that's all that's available. Imagine. you're not dependent on the earth yeah. so your distance to market and you're not hurting the earth as well no. taking more than what you need but also the transport yeah. of those goods i mean yeah. that's probably the farmer's biggest cost mm. transporting those goods keeping them fresh from the farm to the warehouse to the shop. To the actual person that's going to eat that are just for yeah. market. No, it is. Yeah. It is. It's huge. And yeah. the price of fuel, you know, it throws, yeah. throws farmers off. Whereas we deliver to customers within a 10k radius. That's now, where, where, do, where do we exist? Where do we find more about you guys? Because we'd like to send some cameras. We're going to come and check out your place. I'd love to see this. Awesome. Like, I really want to do a little walkthrough of how yeah. the whole thing works. But uh, where can we find you guys to find out more about what you do? So, easiest is go yeah. to the website. Um, aquaponics.africa that's it um, that's our website address very simple or just google ICNIS yeah. you'll, you'll find us yeah. and everything see, you can see on his, on his shirt there there we go <laughs> I-C-H-T-H-Y-S yeah. easy ICTUS ICTUS right. yeah yeah oh, and we've got all the informations on mm. there um, we do free tours of the farm at the moment we're doing those virtually which is great oh, that's fun. cool yeah yeah um, and there's been great interest from all over the world it's fascinating so and it's not just a local thing I mean you you want to go international are you busy international is that something that you that so you our focus is Africa mm -hmm. and we believe that doing aquaponics for Africa is is slightly different to how they do it in America and the likes because we don't have the equipment, we don't have the resources, we don't have the capital costs. The infrastructures. Yeah, and correct. And so, so we've really developed low-cost ways, sustainable ways to do it in Africa. And that's my heart, is Africa. So our focus at the moment, mostly Southern Africa. Um, but we are doing work further up Northern Africa. Um, you know, it's, it's really exciting. And, and the growth has been just phenomenal. It's amazing. Listen, yeah. Justin, really cool having you on the show. Thanks a lot for popping in. I could sit for a day long and chat about this because it really is a phenomenal thing to do and uh, a great thing that you guys have been busy with the last seven years. And I hope that the next seven years are even bigger and booming and amazing. But thanks for joining us and we'd love awesome. to see you at the uh, at your plant. Yeah, so we'll see you guys on, yeah. on our side of town. Okay, I like it. We're going to go and check it out. Ictus, so make sure that you go and follow them. They're on social media as well and they've got a website and all that stuff at Aquaponics. Dot Africa. Correct. Right. Aquaponics. Dot Africa. Simple. Aquaponics. Dot Africa. Go read more about it. Go check it out. These guys are saving the world one fish at a time. So uh, <laughs> go do your part. Just go watch. Thanks for watching. Appreciate it.